Hi, so the paper is on navigating ride-sharing regulations, how regulations change the gig of ride-sharing for drivers in Taiwan. So our study had two primary questions, which was what were the ride-sharing drivers' reactions to the regulations, and how did the regulations impact their work and their technology use? So these questions primarily arose of the current uh, growing trend in regulations. So we're seeing these regulations appearing in London and New York and Pittsburgh, and we're kind of seeing this as a continued trend, which will, con will uh, sorry. And so we're interested in how the actual regulations were affecting the drivers, since it seems like these regulations were primarily speculative about what the actual impacts will be. So for instance, some people have, ar well, sorry, some researchers have argued that these regulations will stifle innovation, while others have said that it will balance the, the differences between taxis, the existing ride-hailing market, and the ride-sharing drivers. So we primarily selected to do our research in Taiwan because Taiwan had three primary stages of regulations. So Uber first entered Taiwan during 2013, and they partnered with the local taxis. However, primarily the um, however, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, however, primarily people still use these taxis, um, and there was this conflict between the original ride-hailing market and these ride-hailing drivers, which resulted in the suspension by the government during uh, 2017 for two months, between April and um, June. So after the suspension period, Uber was regulated. However, when it came back, it significantly changed what, it, what, uh, what the original intention of Uber was. So the regulations were intended to increase the safety of these uh, of ride sharing, while also balancing the the competition between taxis and these ride sharing drivers. So the taxis in Taiwan were state, stating that these ride hailing drivers were uh, making their making it more difficult for them to earn a livelihood. And so the new regulations had each Uber driver have a new license plate. And what this means is they actually have to buy the license plate similar to the existing token systems in places like New York. So this was, uh, uh, the regulations mimic the existing system that the taxis already had operated. And so in essence, this changed how it operated as well because now they're contracted with a new stakeholder, which was with the car rental agencies. And by contracting with the car rental agencies, this changed also the entry and exiting fees and increased the cost that they also had to operate with. So this left several questions about what were the ride-sharing drivers' reactions to these regulatory changes, particularly since they changed significant aspects of um, what ride-sharing was supposed to be, which was sharing the idle property. And now this seems more like the mimicking the traditional ride-hailing, uh, similar to how taxis operated. So it was no longer a gig, but more in the sense of now it was a traditional uh, taxi system. So what we found from our study um, is we found from 19 different interviews gathered from ride-sharing drivers in Taiwan that they kind of had mixed feelings about the regulations. So some people complained that it was now more of a formal job rather than a gig, and this was mostly due to the increased entry and exiting costs, because now that they have to purchase a license plate, they felt more obligated to stay. And now that they also had several other restrictions, such as they had to have a background check, um, and they also have to... Um, file the car rental agencies. And so now they're contracted for a set amount of time. So it was no longer like a gig where you could just log on, log off, um, where there wasn't as much of a penalty for leaving the system. Um, and what the drivers also felt was that the regulations were kind of implemented in a way that wasn't very transparent or easy to find information. So because each of the car rental agencies were also not under a uniform standard, each of the agencies offered different deals, um, and so they felt like it was very difficult to find this information. So one of the participants said, it is actually not enough for others to tell you how you should join Uber. You must find your own information using your personal determinations or from the internet. So from some of our participants, they actually went to the Uber headquarters in, in Taiwan, while others had browsed blogs or internet forums. Um, but the general gist of it is there is no uniform way in how they found the information. And the third thing that they kind of were a little bit more mixed about was the car rental agencies. Some of them felt like they were more predatory, while others found that it was a sense of community and support. 
So this new introduction of stakeholders was kind of surprising and it um, was unique to kind of Taiwan's regulations. However, this is not necessarily something that is isolated to Taiwan. So the reactions, however, overall were generally positive. So despite those mixed feelings, they were primarily um, positive, like they're primarily, uh, they found that because the platform was now legitimized through these regulations, they felt more confident in being able to invest in this platform. Because beforehand, Uber was kind of in this illegal gray area during stage in the suspension period. So there's a lot of this, will it continue? Will it be banned? What will happen to it? And so through this legitimization of the regulations, they felt like they had this newfounded stability. And they also felt like there was an increased safety for both the drivers and for the, the passengers as well. Because now that each of the drivers were, were held more or less liable for their passengers. And I think the most important part of this was also the legal protection. So prior to this, the, the ride-sharing drivers were kind of in a state that if people had sued them or if they were in an accident, it was primarily the driver's fault. And they had minimal recourse in terms of what to do after the accidents. So this is one of the quotes uh, about the legal protection, the legitimization of the platform. So this participant said, if I had a collision with someone else, I don't have to worry that I'm driving for Uber legally when an accident happens. The other thing is, if you drive for Uber without legal protection, how will you face your family? How do you explain to your children and your parents? This is very important. So this was a distinct change from when it was regulated, before, sorry, before it was regulated. So this next question that this kind of raised was, how did the ride-sharing drivers navigate during the suspension periods and the subsequent regulations of ride-sharing? So they primarily used lines. So they appropriated uh, technology that was already existing to kind of create this informal ride-hailing system. So it wasn't necessarily that ride-hailing stopped during that period of time. But rather, because of the disruption by these policy changes, they used and appropriated technology that they had already um, established. In this case, this is how line works. Um, so you can create a group, and you can lead these different kind of messages. So it's kind of like a mixed medium sense. And you can record uh, voice messages, or you can send text messages. And the moderators have a great deal of control into who they invite into the group. So this is also how they kind of avoided detection by legal agencies. Because by setting who can be in the groups, they could kind of control it. So you know, not inviting someone that's going to um, report them to Uber or report them to the government. And so they can do it through multiple means, through the QR code or through mobile links and email. So this just gave them more flexibility. So ride-sharing regulations and heavily affected how these line groups happened. So this primarily occurred during the suspension period when the market was still relatively gray. And so this came out of a way to continue making their living, especially since several of the drivers, when Uber was first released, had actually purchased cars. So they were in extreme debt in some cases. And so they used Line to kind of continue their living. And some of them had quit their jobs when they found out that Uber was in the market. Um, and then afterwards, when it was regulated, because of the existing systems that were created when it was suspended, it still kind of continued on after the regulation period. So it's also important to note that throughout this entire time period, since it first emerged to how it's currently used, lying is still illegal. So these groups are actually um, highly secretive. And they, there's a lot of effort spent to try to avoid detection by both the, the legal agencies and by the Uber platform. Because once the Uber came back, if the Uber platform had found out that they were using these informal ride hailing systems, they would actually shut down the line group and uh, remove the driver's ability to continue driving for Uber. So um, the motivation for these drivers uh, were primarily monetary. However, some did feel an obligation to their customers, because a lot of the times the people who are in the system are people that they have worked with for a while, starting from the suspension period back in 2017 until now. So there's a lot of this kind of um, give and take. So one of the drivers said, line groups are a violation of Uber's regulations. But if I don't pick up these types of passengers, then my salary would be pressed very low. 
But say, for example, if it's a foreign professor and I drive him to dinner, then he says, hey, this weekend I'll go back to the USA. I might ask if I can drive him to the airport. So in this case, the users are both the ride-sharing drivers, but they both approach the customers, and the customers also approach the, the drivers as well. Um, but what was most unique about the line groups was that each of the groups had different policy operations. So even though they occurred organically, each of the groups had extremely different policies that actually kind of uh, differed with, with e each other. So here are the line group policies. So the first thing is about access. So the access to the groups were invitation only, and sometimes the car rental agencies themselves would form these groups as well. Um, and they operated based on different fees. So for instance, some of the groups were primarily concerned with monthly fees, while others are concerned by commission. And so this primarily arose out of the nature of the group as well. And then finally, for designating rides, it, this actually, okay, this part actually affected how the drivers um, picked up rides, whether or not they preferred the line group systems. So for some of the, uh, the what they call themselves a little bit of an older driver, um, they stated that they didn't like the line groups as much because they would have to go and catch the, the rides. So the rides would be sent out through text form, and then whoever catches them first often gets the ride. And so because there was that competition with their reaction speed, this one uh, driver said, personally, my reaction speed is not very fast. Uh, not as fast as the young people's hands and feet. Most often, I cannot outrace them in claiming the dispatch. But, however, that being said, a lot of people still like the line groups because some people, if they have extra rides or customers, they will send the new rides into the chat, and so they will get a commission fee. So in this case, they said, why not use these groups? When I get a percent cut for trips for each ride, I toss in the group. It's like getting paid for doing nothing. And so there was this kind of community sense as well um, where everybody kind of benefited. So the customers and the ride-sharing drivers, in general, both prefer this new informal ride-hailing system. Um, and they said that in some cases it was improvement over Uber. And this is primarily due to the changes in regulation and the existing fee cut, which made Uber a little bit more difficult to sustain. Um, so this person said, I've thought about this problem in your line group. If they toss out a few dispatches, then don't you need to fight to claim it? Um, but you can't possibly always be watching your phone, and watching your phone while driving is a very dangerous thing. I think that is very tiring. Why should I make myself so distressed by using line groups? So this was an example of something that, um, even though they preferred it, there was still this kind of apprehension because it differed with the existing ride-hailing system. Because by using these systems, it made uh, the traveling more difficult. It also was, in some cases, a little bit more difficult to use than Uber. So this is the role of design. Um, so policy impacts the design and the appropriation of technology. So in this case, the regulations heavily impacted how the people use the, the actual technology and whether or not they appropriated new designs. And designing for the users without considering policy can actually change the intended use of a design. So in this case, it disrupted the existing use of Uber and it created this informal ride-hailing system by appropriating existing technology. And then the final question, about all of these findings is, how did this relate to the usability and how do, what does the usability mean to the ride-sharing drivers? Because clearly in this case, the usability by the designers from Uber contrasts sharply with how the ride-sharing drivers actually felt and what kind of systems that they preferred and adopted. So, any questions? Thank you for your talk. I'm Eduardo. I work at Uber as a researcher. Thank you for the same. <laughs> and I'd like to, to hear why, the, from the user perspective, they feel an increased sense of safety and, and how these type of groups, informal groups in line, are actually delivering value to the users. I understand the driver part, but I'd like to understand the, the rider. So I'll answer the first question first. Um, so it seems like in terms of Asia, at least, most of the policies were targeted towards safety. And so in this case, how they increased the safety was they increased the connection between how the drivers are operating with existing uh, databases. So in this case, they had the professional license place. So um, that, that was a way of increasing the safety from a regulation standpoint, and it affected how they use the platforms. Um, 
Sorry, what was your second question? Yeah, I, I was mostly referring to these informal groups oh. in, in line. Uh, so you don't have control on if they are regulated or not and have the license and especially the rider side, so the passenger, how does this system influence and increase sense of uh, safety? So in this case, um, because the access to these groups are so sensitive, most often the customers and the ride-sharing drivers already know each other or have shared a ride through the official Uber platform. And so because of that, um, there is that sense of trust. Um, and because, let's say, for instance, if I'm a customer and I feel like this Uber driver isn't trustworthy, but he's inviting me for a line group, then they can just be like, no, I don't want to do this. And plus there's that sense of, oh, this is illegal. And so they have a... Um, an incentive to kind of avoid uh, distrustworthy customers and distrustworthy drivers. So that's how they increase the safety from an informal standpoint. Hey, Dan Cosley, Cornell again. So that's a really cool talk. It's really interesting to see this tension between kind of, you know, sort of official recognized legality, right, that gives people sort of con sort of a comfort that they can actually do this, and then the um, kind of looking for the best deal for them, which is where I see the story between you, you know, Uber and these, and these line groups, right? So how I guess still need to think about it from the, the Uber point of view. How could Uber sort of make it so that the line groups just weren't actually all that attractive to drivers and it would sort of stay on the platform? So I think this goes into the second question. I'm not entirely sure if it's possible to reverse the use of line groups. And this is primarily because of the way that it was created. And so because of all the different phases and regulations and the threat of regulation and the threat of ban being banned again, these line groups had kind of persisted also as a sense of safety. So if they lose that ability to operate online, or sorry, on Uber, at least they would have a, a sense or ability to earn an income. And so this kind of goes into how we must design for users in regards to how these policies change and the impacts of these policies. Because once there becomes a disruption in, tech, in their use of technology, this disruption seems to be lasting, even though they now have an opportunity on these platforms. Um, I, have, I have a tiny question, and uh, maybe it's related to the first Uber question. Uh, did you get in touch with any of the customers at all? Like, did they find that the line group provide like a more personal experience because they they basically have their dedicated driver in some sense? So I kind of informally gathered in, uh, information on this, and uh, so when I was staying in Taiwan, a lot of the elderly people instead of using Uber, they would actually have um, the numbers of the taxi drivers that they like. So there was already this kind of informal system, and so this kind of, this kind of informal ride hailing was kind of augmenting that original uh, usage. Um, so I think in that case, there is that engendered trust already. Um, sorry, great. Answer your yes, okay. great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank speaker. You.